Welcome to another episode of Let Go and Lead, where we discuss the new realities of leadership with pioneers, provocateurs, and passionate leadership champions. My guest today is Scott Snook, a recognized expert on authentic leadership development, which is a popular course he's taught at Harvard Business School for over a decade. Prior to joining Harvard, Scott had an impressive career in the military, graduating at the top of his cadet class at West Point and ultimately retiring from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers after 22 years of distinguished service. In addition to holding both an MBA and a PhD from Harvard, Scott's received many prestigious military decorations. They include the Master Parachutist Badge and the Legion of Merit Award. He's also the author of Friendly Fire an influential and award-winning book on managerial thinking that draws on his experience in the military. I'm excited to talk with Scott about the lessons he has for us as leaders. So get comfortable and get ready to let go and lead. So today we're here with Scott Snook. Scott, my gosh, you've had such a distinguished career in both the U.S. military and academia. And I'm just so thrilled to have you with us at Let Go and Lead. Oh, it's great to be here. This is my passion. Well, it certainly isn't. It looks like your passion's also around creating transformational leadership development and high impact interventions. So we're going to have a great time talking about that. So why don't we just dig in? You know, my first question really is um, to ask you a little bit about your military service. And of course, thank you so much for that. We so appreciate your service to the country. But you graduated from West Point, which, of course, is always impressive in and of itself. But you also were the most outstanding cadet. That was pretty cool. Then as you went on, you spent 22 years in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and you retired with the rank of colonel. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. In the course of that, One thing I saw that I thought was so interesting is that you earned four very critical awards among many, as I understand it, but they were each different in their own right. The Legion of Merit, the Bronze Star, the Purple Heart, the Master Parachute Badge. Did any one of those have special meaning for you? Probably two in particular. I mean, the Legion of Merit is a long-term service award. Uh, Bronze Star was for service in combat, but The uh, Master Parachutist Badge, they started out uh, jumping out of perfectly good airplanes at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And um, it's just uh, the 82nd Airborne Division. It's such a storied unit and um, you get such wonderful soldiers there. And so for that was my launch pad as a young second lieutenant coming out of um, out of West Point and having great non-commissioned officers, great soldiers, um, just couldn't wait to go to work every day. And the Master Parachutist Badge is you have to have so many jumps and then you go to jump master school and you have to be qualified jump master and you have to do that for so many jumps and um so that's kind of that's the fun part um jumping out of planes with uh you know a hundred of your your closest friends well it really the guy started thinking about that and i thought of course you know this whole podcast is around letting go i bet you really have to learn to let go (laughs) yeah but hold on (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right, there's always another. There's always a tension, right? Letting go and holding on, trying to find the right balance in those. But uh, no, that was wonderful. I mean, I, my first assignment was really uh, two big things. One, it just got me committed to leading, um, and my undergraduate degree was in nuclear engineering, high energy physics, quantum mechanics. It's fascinated by the the beauty and um, the clarity and specificity and of of numbers. Right. And I love math, science and engineering. So I went in the Corps of Engineers, but then I got out in the army and I realized it's all about people. <laughs> so, um, you know, when I was thinking about graduate school, I was like, I'm not going back, um, in nuclear engineering, I'm going to go back. Something has to do with people and organizations because yeah. that's where it all happens. And you went to Harvard, as I recall, right? You have an MBA and a PhD from Harvard in organizational psychology? Or- yeah, we, we call it organizational behavior, OB. But it's, um, yeah, you pretty much have to earn uh, all of the PhD requirements in either psychology or sociology. And uh, there are a bunch of organizational level and managerial courses at the business school that you have to take. Um, and I'd already gotten my MBA when I went through the PhD program there. So um, yeah, no, it's wonderful. The f- five years, five of my years in the army were spent at Harvard, two getting my MBA and three getting my PhD. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't realize you were doing those concurrently. Yeah. And they, they only do that. So in the army, you have, 
we'll send people to graduate school to get degrees because it's a huge organization. We got people, you know, qualified to do almost anything you can think of, but to f- go fully funded in the army, there has to be a job that's coded that requires that specific degree. So Kathy and I, my wife was a classmate of mine at West Point, first class with women. She's incredible. Highest ranking woman in the first class. Um, just watching those intrepid women, um, during those four years. No, nope. imagine this, my, my, no women in the upper three classes, very few in the staff and faculty, and pretty much nobody wanted them there. I mean, it, we started with about, I think, 120, 121 women out of 18, 1,400 cadets in our class. And four years later, we graduated with 800 something. That was a normal attrition rate. And out of the 120 or so women, I think we graduated with um, about 60, 50 or 60. Well, Kathy must have shown the boys what they were missing. He's amazing. The way I said it, look, there was, um, you know, uh, there was 100 women and 4,000 guys, and she picked me. So that's 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 my greatest accomplishment. Being a numbers man, you would really appreciate those odds. <laughs> She's the numbers one. So literally, we we um, one of the reasons we went this sort of academic route was um, we loved, we fell in love with teaching and we wanted to still stay in and serve, but we want to have a family. And so as the family grew and we have five children, one way for us to stay in in uniform and serve and still have a predictable enough life to have a family life was to go the academic route. So we both looked at assignments at West Point and that's why they send you to graduate school to get a master's. You come back and teach. We fell in love with teaching. Then they selected us for permanent faculty at West Point. Then they sent us back to get our PhDs. Then we went back to teach at West Point. Um, nice gated community to raise a family. And uh, four of our five children followed us into the professional arms and also went to West Point. Oh, wow. That's incredible. I have to ask what the fifth one did. <laughs> oh, Jessica. She's our angel. She was born um, with uh, epilepsy. She has seizure disorders. So she, she had special needs, developmental needs. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. But is she doing well now? Uh, we talk about crucibles in our course on uh, authentic leader development. So the biggest crucible in my life, we we lost our daughter um, the night, uh, like the week of her seven, 19th birthday. She went to sleep one night and um, and just didn't wake up. So oh, I'm so sorry, Scott. And, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And it, it really, those kind of things really cause you to pause and Make sure you have your priorities straight. Um, but she's she's a blessing. She's an angel. We talk about her every day, and um, we learn so much from her. We still do. I'm so sorry to hear of your loss. As you talk about a crucible, like what did that get you to rethink? Yeah, I mean these these searing moments uh, in our lives that seem to be heavily laden with meaning. That's how we talk about them. That yeah. you keep returning to. Um, it could be getting bullied in junior high school. It could be the first getting time you got fired at, for getting shot for me or whatever it is. And you keep returning to them and you squeeze them for learning. Right. Um, and losing Jessica, I mean, it just causes you to just remind us that every day is really, really important. And then specifically Jessica with special needs, sort of, um, sort of low IQ, sweet disposition lived in the moment, every moment. Right. So the biggest lesson yeah. in her was, like there was no yesterday she didn't worry about. She didn't worry about tomorrow. She lived absolutely in the moment. And um, and both her life and her passing, you know, were huge reminders that there, <laughs> there is no tomorrow. There is no yesterday. Yeah. It's just today, right now, you and I right here, Mary. How has that affected your ability to relate to other people going through tough times? One of the big lessons we teach also is around resilience, hardiness, and grit. So if you think about tough times, right, Um, if I had one human attribute, you know, you study all these attributes and leadership and correlate them with leader effectiveness and success. And if I could give my five children one attribute above uh, above good looks, athletic ability, high IQ, it would be this one. It would be resilience or hardiness or grit, right? The ability to respond um, in a positive way um, to difficult challenges, to adversity, right? And it's the gift that keeps on giving and our children are going to live through all sorts of diversity. Right. And, um, how you do that. And basically, you know, you think I'm a very visual learner, like right? you're going uh-huh. along like this and then you hit a bump and what happens when you're down here? Um, do you keep going down? Do you keep spiraling down? Do you bounce back up? Do you come back stronger? And 
the second lesson is, do you learn and what do you learn from all those crucibles in your life? And you just keep squeezing them for, for wisdom and knowledge. And, um, and so for me, it's, it's, a, it's a huge lesson, right? Adversity and how you, how you deal with it is it's everything, especially for leaders. Yeah. This is making me think about another military term, VUCA, right? That, you know, the whole idea that people go through such incredible change. Yeah. So, you know, the VUCA came out of this, you know, post cold war kind of, we think of an old school now uh, military environment with when you think of sort of linear warfare and sort of predictable plans and, you know, checkpoints and draw lines. And, and we decided, you know, at the end of the cold war, you know, what was the future going to look like, which of course is a setup, right? No, we didn't know what it was going to look like next week, let alone, you know, <laughs> 10 or 15 years out, which, when you think about the defense budget, I mean, we're, those are building new weapon systems and equipping a force and developing and training a force for 10 years, 20 years out. Um, it takes that long. And so you ask, what's the future going to look like? And basically it was, well, I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but it's certainly going to trend on, I have a six one, but on VUCA, but it's going to be more volatile, more uncertain, more chaotic, more complex and more ang ambiguous. Right. And Little do we know, and this was back 1989, 1990, how VUCA the world was going to get. And it <laughs> continues to kind of go that way. Yeah. And it's, it's affected everything. It's affected how we think about leading on the battlefield. Uh, it's affecting how we think about development of our leaders as well. When you have students who come in who have never had work experience, they have no concept of leadership. How do you describe to them what leadership is? We actually use the West Point the organization, the Corps of Cadets as a leadership, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's an experiment. And so they're actually in. So if you're a freshman at West Point, you learn how to follow, <laughs> you know, which is good. I mean, you, you need to learn how to follow before you leave. If you're a sophomore, we actually give them uh, this is the cadet leader development system. We actually give them one or two freshmen that they're responsible for their development and growth and education. And then when they're juniors, um, we give them a small unit of a squad or a platoon to learn how to, you know, like how to, it's more than just two people or three people. And then when you're seniors, we make them cadet officers and they got to learn about the systems and larger numbers and how do you create conditions and culture that's healthy and helping people to grow. So when you say most of our cadets never really, they might not have had a job or lived or worked in an organization, we create that leadership laboratory every minute, every day. And then in the summer, they have leadership opportunities. So they really get a lot of experience pretty young. Um, but for them, it's mostly conceptually. And then as a teacher, what we do is, what do our students know? Movies. I use my teaching. I use, I heavily rely on short video vignettes and video clips and a lot of it from movies because um, you need a richer median. I mean, I, I believe in the case study method. I am Harvard trained, but you need a richer medium than just written cases, I think, um, to really get under the deep, um, the deep dynamics and foundations of leading and the relationships about leading and, and being led. What's one of your favorite movie clips that you like to use? Now I'm dating myself. When I used full length movies, I used um, at West Point, I was using the movie Platoon. So I was this is back from Vietnam era. And I would use series yeah. of video clips about different cultures. There were the in in the movie platoon it was so good i mean they had the uh sort of rednecks in the platoon then they had the the hippies and the druggies and then you had this leader this young second lieutenant so i would show all sorts of video clips from that from the previous wars and then as things went on you know specific things you would pick m movies um from their era that would you know ring a bell for them it's interesting when you talked about it the freshman year, you teach cadets how to follow. Yeah. I think now many of us as executives are really rethinking how to follow. It seems that a lot of leadership is really following as well as leading. Oh, I, 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 I mean, if I, if I'm king for a day and, a lead, and had the opportunity to uh, design a leadership intervention, a systematic program education, we spend way too much time thinking in this direction. I yeah. don't care how senior you are, right? You're always working for someone, learning how to manage up. And there's only a few, a handful, rare few of research and articles about 
being an effective follower, right? How to make your boss look good, how to figure out how different bosses manage their environment. I mean, you don't get to lead and leadership, you're, you're always caught in this, you know, you're leading people down and you're working for other people. And we spend right. so much time on this sort of top down sort of thinking I'm the leader and how do I get my subordinates to follow me when you don't even have a chance to do that if you can't manage up very well. So I'm absolutely... I mean, we should have courses on every every program that has a course on leadership should have a course in followership. One of the other things I want to ask you about is, in addition to um, teaching, you've authored several books or, and co-authored several. And um, I'm particularly thinking about your book, Friendly Fire, which, of course, was really a story about the U.S. Blackhawks being shot down over northern Iraq. But is that, it's won many awards as a managerial book. What, what is the story and what's the connection? So that passion grew out of two streams. My own personal experience, I was um, on the wrong end. I was a victim of friendly fire in my first time in combat. The big one in the Caribbean, at Grenada, um, in, wow. in, in uh, 1983. Um, and it was a fairly serious case of friendly fire. I think 19 of us were wounded. One or two later died. Um, a U.S. Navy A-6 fighter pilot mistakenly fired on our position on the ground. And as a young leader, I was like, how could that happen? <laughs> like, I just, I still couldn't imagine, you know, how, how that could happen, right? The best trained, best equipped people in the world um, can sometimes fall short of the mark. And so in the back of my mind, I always had this idea. And then when I got to graduate school, you know, you got to write a dissertation about something. So I was ready to do this, had my dissertation proposal written, which is most of the work. And I literally got an email or a call from my, um, my, a guy who ran the squash team at Army when I was on the squash team at Army. And he was a, an English professor when he was a captain. And now he was running the Office of Congressional Leadership, OCL, um, in the Pentagon as a colonel. And he said, Scott, I don't know if you've been following this friendly fire incident in northern Iraq, but the one court martial from this mid-level supervisor in AWACS just finished. The, all the legal proceedings are done. He said... As far as I know, you're still at Harvard studying organizational behavior. So we need to figure out what happened now that the legal stuff's done. And literally sent me all the unredacted copies of the Article 32 investigation, the accident investigation, the court martials, and boxes and boxes of data. And I just dove into it and did a multi-layered analysis of trying to figure out something that on its surface makes no sense at all. Literally broad daylight, unlimited visibility, not a hot shooting war going on high visibly, you know, VIPs in this helicopter and two F-15s flying under the positive control of an AWACS, the most advanced airborne warning control system in the world. And I think by doing such a deep dive in an organization around an incident like this, you see everything. You see cultural issues. You see performance issues. You see communications issues. You see status hierarchy. Who do you listen to? Who don't you? You see habits and you see silos, and it was all there. And this terrible tragedy allows you to focus on one moment in time, on one grid square over um, in northern Iraq, and where everything came together in a terrible moment. And you get to go back and back and figure out how organizations fall apart. And um, so it was compelling. So what were some of the things that you found? Well, first of all, I went in with a bias, <laughs> um, having been on the wrong end of friendly fires. Like these are two words that don't go together, right? It's right. Like jumbo right. shrimp or military intelligence, right? These are words that don't go together. Um, I thought for sure, you know, I, these are two fighter pilots. They're just out looking for a kill. They're, you know, undisciplined. Um, I thought these AWACS guys must have been asleep because there's nothing going on. Um, and I, and then, you know, I didn't know what was going on. The helicopters got shot down, but I was like, Clearly, there was bad actors in here, bad apples, you know, nothing like this happens without, you know, ridiculous stuff. And the more I learned, so the first big insight was, if I can really put myself in their shoes, either the F-15 pilots or the AWACS guys, or the, I probably, knowing what they did, being embedded in the culture and doing what they were doing each day, I, I'm not convinced I would have done anything differently. And that's really scary because if you find a bad apple or somebody doing something illegal or something, it's easy. You get rid of the bad apple. The system's good. Everybody was doing what they were doing every other day. And so this is called practical drift. Everybody 
you know, we put rules and all sorts of systems in place to prevent these low probability events with huge downsides from ever happening. And yet everybody was doing what they were doing the day before. And you know what? God gets a vote and um, there's a stochastic element and everything. And it all came together. And, you know, just a reminder of how fragile organizations are. Did you find things that could be changed to prevent that? <laughs> That's the hardest part, right? I mean, yeah. when you find out, and so this notion of practical drift, in other words, here's an example, right? So we have, <laughs> we consume safety margins, right? So this is around safety, but um, think of speed limits, right? If we wanted to have zero highway fatalities this year, given how safe cars are and the roads are, just think about how safe the tires and the bodies around us and airbags. If we had um, 30 mile an hour speed limits and everybody followed them, we would have almost zero. We could almost get to zero, right? So this right. is my first insight. It's like, is that we push, when we try to optimize, we try to optimize so many different goals or variables in organizations. If you just want to optimize one, like no traffic fatalities. Well, people will go crazy because no, I want to drive 60 miles. And whatever you put as a speed limit, people are going to go more than that, right? So, um, and they're going to figure out where their limits are. So it's really hard to put systems in place, um, understanding human behavior. And one of them is we trying to, op humans are always trying to optimize more than one variable. Friendly fire. We could have had zero friendly fire incidents. Um, let's take the Iraq war. Um, which had the highest percentage of any that we know of, but we we could have had zero if we lined all our soldiers up in the south, around Kuwait or whatever, and held them, had them dress right dress, and line up in formation and move towards the bad guys, right? And we know everybody is, and so you're not going to shoot anybody. But we would have taken a lot of casualties from other, you know, from other reasons. One of the reasons there was so much friendly fire, and almost. So few total casualties is no one can move and in the front, the top, the round as fast as we can fight under you know conditions of limited visibility at night and dark. Um, and when the enemy, most of the time the enemy died, they never knew we were there. That's a good thing from my perspective. But think about that: the enemy didn't know we were there. We've got people, special forces people out here. We've got Blackhawks over here. We got you know gunships here. We got bombers up Air Force, and so we got three. You know, what we did was we reduced the number of total casualties. We increased the likelihood that we would shoot each other. And so, but you can never look at a, a widow or a mother and say, this is the price of doing business, right? We actually saved a lot of lives because of the way we fight today, but we increased the likelihood we might kill one of our own. And so that's, for me, that understanding of how goals can conflict multiple goals or values go in any organization that lists core values. Anybody can list five core values. It's only when two things you care about come into conflict. I care about my job. I care about my family. Only then does it become interesting. Right. And so, so there were layers and layers. Um, and for me, it was in the end, it was constantly revisiting um, relationships in organizations. It all came down to trust and relationships. And you, you know, as you just brought this back to conflicting values as an example or conflicting goals, how do you um, think about that with your students in terms of how a leader manages that? So one of, one of our lessons in ALD is on core values. And I, it's one of the few times I really get on a soapbox and I just say, look, if you want to discuss what your values should be, That'd be arrogant for me to su suggest, Meryl, this is what you should think, you know, but, or go across the river to Harvard University instead of the Harvard Business School and over there, go to the philosophy department and you can debate, you know, what the best values are and all those things. The, but if you want to lead other people, you need, to, you absolutely need to know what's most important to you. And not only know, be clear in your mind what your core values are, but have the ability to communicate those effectively with other people. Then, like if I want to come work for you, Meryl, and you're my you're a potential leader, my boss, you should be able to tell me what your leadership philosophy is. 
which is built from your core values. It might be fairness. That means you'll hire and fire based on merit. and You won't based on these things and what your boundaries are. And you've got to, you as a leader need to have a clear philosophy of like that explains to me, if you come work with me, here's what you can expect from me as a leader. If you don't know what your core values are, don't lead, right? If you want to, if you don't want to, if you don't care about core values and you want to go live in a cave somewhere and never interact with another human being, that's fine. But if you want to lead other people, everything flows from that. It's the wellspring from which everything flows. And so it's hard work getting clarity around what's most important to you. And just think about how it seems so easy, right? Well, obviously, whatever is most important, I know what that is because it's the most important thing, but it's always the hierarchy and which one is more important than the other ones. And really good leaders, really high quality elite organizations have a very clear sense of what's important to them. So of course I have to ask, what's important to you? Oh, for me, it's, it's, um, it's my faith and how that plays out in relationships. So, I mean, it sounds vague, but you know, all sorts of examples and I've built, and I'm always stunned. Uh, I just taught a week long program in authentic leader development to executives last week. And I asked them how many show of hands, how many of you have a leadership philosophy, you know, written down a half page of what people can expect from you as a leader and like no one or two hands. And when you're in the military, because there's so much turnover and you're constantly changing, I'm on version 22 or something of my leadership philosophy. And it starts from, you know, a set of values that are hot, even hot buttons for me, things that set me off irrationally and builds into sort of what I call leadership principles. So again, fairness, I, I get, I, I just get, emotionally whacked out if I see something that's unfair. Like that guy cut me off in traffic. That's not fair. He's going to get, you know, I mean, and then how does that play out in a principle? Well, I'll, I will only hire and fire based on merit. And then how does that build into a philosophy? Then I put it together in a paragraph. So, um, but then there's five or six of those, right? So merit based, I mean, literally, you know, and what does proficiency mean to me and what's in, and then the values of Brown, um, kindness and love and taking care of each other and servant leadership, all that's sort of woven in there uh, that comes up with a, a philosophy. It's like, and then people are like, ew, um, that's so different than how I see the world. Then that's fine because it's all about Matt, right? It's all about a matching game, right? Finding a good organization and a good boss. But if the boss or the organization doesn't know who they are, then we're never going to get a good match. And it's really sad. You see, as a consultant, you go in and see terrible matches, you know, leaders that should never be in that industry or that business. I've seen people never should be in the army. I mean, um, just too far removed from their essence for who they are. And to your point about really knowing who you are, I've seen a lot of leaders really fall apart when challenged because they weren't able to go back to what grounds them. The summative exercise we do in our course is we have them craft a purpose statement. It's really an essence. That it's an es it's a short phrase that captures the essence of who they are, who they've always been, who in every context. This is if you weren't there, this is what we'd miss. The one unique thing you bring to the world, right? And it's it's a well, it's only a couple words, um, but if you get it about right, and you put a Fermi brain imaging machine, everything would light up. I mean, it literally uh -huh. um, connects you, and the process of getting to craft this statement powerfully, and I love this word in English, reminds us, reminds us of who we've always been, of who we are. And if you think about um, leaders or people that you enjoy being around or respect, there's two things, right? Sort of clarity. They know who they are and who they're not. They're not trying to prove anything. And they're, they're, they're comfortable with that. So clarity and comfort, all my programs, those are the two goals. We're trying to move the dial on greater self-awareness and self-acceptance. And want to guess which one is the harder one for most people? Self-awareness or self-acceptance? I guess self-acceptance. Yeah. I mean, because I get so many type A people are pushing and pushing. And um, and if you find, so, I mean, the absolute worst, I think, attribute in a leader is someone who's um, insecure. And insecurity in strange ways plays out quite often as bravado and trying to make up for it. Right. Most secure leaders will ask questions. They don't want to talk all the time. Um, they say, I don't know this. I don't know. Help me understand. Right. So, and the most insecure, like I got this, here's where I get, I mean, you know, and that they're trying to be someone they think they should be. Right. And so we try to fight that by just 
just move and it's lifelong work, self-awareness, self-acceptance. We're never a hundred percent there. And we don't have much experience working on ourselves, right? So it's a different type of work when you're working on yourself. The other thing you've talked a lot about is how high performance is at the intersection of, I think you describe it as high support and high challenge. Can you talk a little bit about that? I thought that was interesting. So I think all growth and development and performance happens at the intersection of high challenge, high support. So man, think of it as someone in your life, a parent, a coach, a teacher, a boss who got more out of you than you ever imagined you could do. In the moment, you might not necessarily like that person. <laughs> they knew, they thought you were better than you thought you were. So high challenge, if you think about a two by two matrix, challenge, support, high, low, high, low. Well, obviously, you know, too much support, not enough challenge. We're in our comfort zone. We don't grow. We don't push it. This is unfortunately the culture. My children grew up here in the education system in Concord, Massachusetts, where everybody gets a trophy. Nobody gets cut from the hockey yeah. team. I'm not sure if the world doesn't work that way. In fact, I mean, I think the pendulum swung way too far around self-esteem. Look, you mm -hmm. can't give someone self-esteem. You actually has to be earned. And I'll use a really crazy example. My oldest son, Sean, came home, fifth grade, had a one-page story that he wrote, a little smiley sticker on the top. I went to see his fifth grade teacher. I said, Sean brought this home. He goes, yeah, isn't that nice? Sean wrote a story. I said, yeah, but there's no there's sentence structures out, punctuation's wrong, a lot of misspellings. He says, oh, we don't want to hurt his little feelings. You know, I... <laughs> like fifth grade, right? You know, it's, I get yeah. it. So too much support, not enough challenge. We're in our comfort zones. We don't grow too much challenge, not quite enough support. We freeze, we paralyze, we don't engage. We don't take any risks, right? We, we, yeah. we just freeze up. Right. And so all you, high challenge, high support, call it tough love. Does it better be loved or feared is this question. It's the first case study I ever wrote. So I talk about taking wisdom where I can find it. It's, um, it's called A Tale of Two Coaches, Bobby Knight and Coach K. So Bobby Knight, this legendary college basketball coach, and he coached at Army at West Point. And one of his players, team captain at Army, was a guy named Mike Krzyzewski, Coach K, who uh -huh. went on to coach at Duke. Um, and Bobby Knight is old school. <laughs> anyway, and they went on. I wrote a case study where they both were at the top of their games, best at what they did. Um, old school, Bobby Knight, younger generation, Coach K. Is it better to be loved or feared? And of course, it's a setup. The answer is yes, right? Tough love. Someone <laughs> who got the most out of you era was someone who pushed you, knew you could be better, and that came from a place of love. I love that. Yeah. I'm thinking about, again, coming back to the concept of letting go and leading. And you also talk a lot about the fact that leaders can't control the outcomes, but you can control the circumstances that lead people to a good outcome. Can you talk a little bit about that? So one of my favorite mini case studies, I'm going back to these two coaches again, is uh, from Coach K. Um, and this iconic game is 19, what was it 1992 regional championship in NCAAs, I think it was. They're playing Kentucky. Some people think it's the best game in college basketball it's ever been played. It's iconic. Anyway, basically, uh, they're in overtime and a kid from Kentucky comes down, hits a bank shot and, you know, crazy shot. And with 2.1 seconds left and Duke calls timeout comes over coach K and coach K tells the story. He's such a reflective practitioner. It's a beautiful example of emotional intelligence, EQ, the highest levels. So when coach tells the story, Mike's telling the story, he's like, I'm angry. You know, I mean, the kid, I said, I don't mind losing, but the kid, I mean, it wasn't a dunk. It wasn't a good play. He just threw it off the boards and he didn't call it. I mean, it was a terrible shot. Anyway, he said, so I'm angry. He said, I had a towel in my hand. I threw it in the ground. Right. So for me, if you think the five components of EQ, right, self-awareness, he's incredibly self-aware in the moment. I'm angry. I'm pissed. One of the great lessons, like never, ever deny emotions in yourself or anybody else. Emotions just are. Emotions precede cognition by microseconds, perhaps. They're the most authentic thing we have. Like, like, Meryl, have you ever been angry and somebody says, well, you really shouldn't be upset about that. And that just right. pisses you off more. <laughs> never tell someone else how they should feel. And never deny whatever emotions you're feeling. Now, what you do with that anger, Coach K in this game, he said, I threw that on the ground. He, the second part of EQ from self-awareness is self-regulation, right? It's what you do with the emotions where you see maturity. And so he, 
Bobby Knight, instead of throwing a chair at a referee, he, you know, Coach K, you know, launched himself, used that energy and disappointment, launched himself off the bench, grabbed each one of his players. Remember, figure out where they are, meet them there. The third component of EQ, empathy. So now he's the first two are about the leader, self-awareness, self-regulation, and then empathy, figure out where my people are. He goes out and he grabs, he looks at Leitner and Kristen Leitner's blaming Robbie Hurley and Bobby Hurley's blaming Kristen Leitner. And he can see that, you know, never things go bad, the blame game starts. And then he looks at his, his best player, Grand Hill, and Grand Hill's got this far away look in his eyes. I don't know what beach we're going to be on, but we're not going to the final four. So he figures <laughs> out where they are and he grabs every one of his players by the shoulder and looks them right in the eye and says, we're going to win we're gonna win right and that's the last two components of emotional intelligence right are um motivation and social skills which we normally think of as leading the first two are about leading yourself and then empathy is the pivot to others and then motivating them and using your social skills and the trust he built up over the three four years coaching them and what did he do he sits them down on the bench and i asked him about this i said is that leading or misleading Right. There's 2.1 seconds left. The ball's at the end of the court and you're down by a point. And then he sort of said, well, what would you have me do? He said, we're going to win. I said, what would you have me do as a coach? You know, he's, and he says, well, go to the bench. Everybody gets a break, grabs their attention. He says, look up, you know, look up at the scoreboard. He says, tell you what, guys, uh, I ran the numbers. <laughs> Here are the odds on a team coming back, you know, with less than three seconds left down by a point and the ball's at the other end of the court. He said, that's not what you do. That's not what leaders do, right? And so what he did was, and, and of course, it's iconic. And Grand Hill comes in, throws a three-quarter of a pass. Christian Leitner catches it, turns around, takes a jump shot. They win the game. They go on to win the second straight national championship. Um, and the question is, I always ask my executives, my students is, did Coach K determine the outcome of the game? And it's kind of a trick question. It was like, you know, everybody say, yeah, he did it. He did it. I said, no, what did he do? He shifted the odds. He gave, he, all we can do as leaders. And I, I talked to, you know, leaders and future leaders. I said, look, if you want to control everything, most of us do, right. And you want to be, be an individual contributor. There's nothing wrong with that. If you're an individual contributor and expert, if you work smarter, faster, harder, you can control your outcomes. You get rewarded for what you do. If you want to step in the leadership arena, you now are stepping into a probabilistic endeavor. Because now you're going to get rewarded based on what other people do. And you can never control everything else. And so our challenge, and I learned this from Friendly Fire, is how do you create conditions that increase the likelihood we're going to get the outcomes we want and decrease the likelihood we won't get those that we don't. And that is a scary place for people because guess what, Meryl? You can do everything right as a leader and still fail. And we know some business leaders do everything wrong, get lucky. Um, it's a probabilistic endeavor. Soldiers, military, you can be the best soldier out there, do everything right and still catch a bullet. So for me, that's when Brene Brown talks about vulnerability, putting yourself out there with no guarantees. And that's the strongest thread in everything I teach. I love her research on that. You cannot lead without being vulnerable, without putting yourself. When Coach K said, we're going to win. He put himself out there, and there's no guarantees that they were going to win. But, of course, they did, and it's a great story. That is a fabulous story. I know you've been reflecting a lot after all your years of leadership personally and then all your years of studying and teaching and researching leadership. You've come to a couple summary statements that I'd love to have you share with our listeners. Yeah, you get a little reflective. Um, and I was blessed, you know, as, oh my gosh, 1976 at West Point, the beginning of sort of leadership as a pseudo academic discipline and actually studying it and researching it in depth, you know, and it started around that time. And we started the first leadership department in any college. It's called Behavioral Science and Leadership Department, BSNL. The first head of the department, amazing guy, General Prince. Um, and we wrote the first textbook on leadership, leading organizations, LIO. I mean, we wrote, I mean, so I saw it from the beginning as a cadet, and then I got to teach it as a captain and then help do the research as a lieutenant colonel and then come to HBS and do the research again. And so you watch from, you know, really 50 years of doing real, you know, where leadership has been sort of a pseudo academic discipline and billions of dollars. We all know how much money's been spent and is continuous spent on leader development programs and things. And I started asking, have we moved the dial? <laughs> and so you start to look around in the major domains in society and you look at 
religious leaders, you look at political leaders, at academic leaders, at business leaders, medical, healthcare, like, and you're like, I don't know. I mean, has the general quality, overall quality, would most people in organizations, their overall quality of their leaders, is, have we had much of an impact? And so actually this reflection started about 10 years ago when I was still teaching leadership courses. And I make a distinction between leader development and leadership development. And I mean, all those words in the English language that end in ship, penmanship, sportsmanship, salesmanship, seamanship, right? You can learn, you can get a book on how to sail a boat, learn seamanship, right? But until you get out on the water and the wind's coming off the left and your hands on the, you know, on the, on the tiller, you don't under, quite understand what tacking means until you do it. So I think we were teaching leadership, the art and science, which is really power and influence, right? How to how to mobilize the efforts of people towards some some shared goal. We were teaching, I'll take my MBA students, we were teaching them leadership skills, leadership, the art, and I think that's the 70-20-10 rule we all know. Like 70% you learn leading, 20% great coaching and feedback, and 10% maybe in a classroom. And what I was doing was I was, my leadership courses were teaching MBA students how to be mercenaries. We were teaching them how to wield power and influence, get things done before we did the foundational a priori, the groundwork of why are you leading and for to what end, right? And so that's when I shifted about 15 years ago to leader development, which I believe is the same thing as Warren Bennis, who says, same thing as human development. Let's work on the instrument of leading. And this leads to my last insight, which is what I've been doing. I went from big macro systems stuff like friendly fire and safety and stuff all the way down to working on people and, and the, are they self-aware and self and like, and literally figure out if they're self-aware and they're comfortable with who they are, maybe it's okay not to lead, right? To the extent they have a clear sense of who you are, your core values, um, what your strengths are, what your strengths aren't to the extent you have a clear sense of all that, right? We believe that people will step up when they should lead and in the right environments and won't when they shouldn't, which gets me the last provocative statement I'll leave you with. Um, I started writing an HBR article. The article is pretty bad, but the, the title I like, it's not everyone should lead and that's okay. And I know this is sacrilegious in my field where I lead from the front. Everybody's a leader. We want everybody in an organization to be a leader. We want, and when I got to be careful here, because the word lead means so many things. So when I say lead, I mean, uppercase L right? Have in a formal leadership position where you have authority and responsibility for other people's lives and their work and their growth and development and success. Like really, you can be a leader in your field and everybody should be a leader in their field. That's not what I'm talking about. What we mean is leaders, right? Not everybody should do that. And that's okay. And I can't tell you, every article I read gets, well, oh, everybody should leave. Oh, we all should be. And then, and people are, my students are looking at me, executives are like, oh man, I thought you were going to say we should all be leaders. And then I ask him, I said, how many people in this room think that everyone should be a triple board certified pediatric neurological surgeon? Show of hands. Everybody's like, no. Well, why not? Because not everybody on the planet has the mental ability, the physical dexterity, and the emotional stability to operate on little babies' brains. Why then do we believe that everyone should lead, that everyone has the motivation, the skills, the attributes? Um, and the core values to be an effective leader. And so what happens is I think all our organizations are designed that the only way you can move up, we define success as moving up, getting more money, right. more prestige, more status, is to move from what? Individual contributor to a managerial role and then a more senior role. And more, that is absolutely the worst reason to go lead, right? Not everybody should do that. If the heart of your organization is somebody who writes code and they hate people, put them in a room by themselves. Um, don't ever make them a team leader for other code writers. If they hate people, just let them write code, pay them a lot while they write code. In fact, they should get one of the biggest meritocracies, professional sports. We got our Celtics. We're watching the Celtics right now in the playoff sports, the, the real athletes, um, actors, the artists, they get paid more than their coaches or the, right. Because right. It's a pure meritocracy. If you're the best, you get paid for what you do. They get paid more than their coaches. That should be the same way in organizations, unless the real talent is in leading. So anyway, I um, I think we end up with people leading for all the wrong reasons. And if you're never asked the question, 
you know, why are you going to lead? Or if you don't have a good answer to that question, why, why are you leading? You shouldn't be leading. <laughs> so that's, that's my, <laughs> that's my sales pitch for, for taking a program to figure out who you are. But so what, what will the future look like? Is it unfolding? Like, do you know yet? Yeah. I mean, I'm getting into it. I'm, I'm actually spending those, each of those trends. I'm, I'm, getting back into music, which is a passion of mine. I spend, I walk in the morning and at night at daybreak and right before dark, I'm doing, you know, I'm, and I'm still teaching a little bit, but I'm, you know, I'm really much more clear and intentional about how I spend the dwindling number of days on the planet. Right. And so I, I, I want to, I've been helping, trying to figure out how to help other people live more meaningful lives, which is mm -hmm. my entire purpose. I want to make sure I do that as well in the last third of my life. Well, this has been just incredible. Thank you so much, Scott. Oh, I welcome. can't even believe our time's up already. I could have asked you so many more questions. But thanks for joining us on Let Go and Lead. Thank you. I really enjoyed how plain spoken and candid Scott was in our conversation about the art of leadership. One of my biggest takeaways was his advice that if you want to lead other people, you need to be clear in your mind about what your own core values are. And you need to be able to communicate those effectively to others. He said that this can be hard work, but having a clear leadership philosophy is essential so that people who report to you know what they can expect from you as a leader. He said if you can't do that, you shouldn't lead other people. I also loved his story about Coach K motivating his team to win the game, seemingly against all odds. The lessons for leaders in that story was that we can't control the outcome. We instead need to focus on creating the conditions for our team that increase the likelihood we're going to get the outcomes we want. He said that letting go of control is scary for leaders because we have to be vulnerable and that there's no guarantee that things will turn out the way we want them to. But as in the case of Coach K, when they do, the results can be amazing. I was also impressed by the breadth of stories and anecdotes that Scott drew from as he spoke. I've long believed that storytelling is one of the most important skills that any leader can develop and stories enable you to connect with your people and inspire them to do great things. Clearly, Scott has honed that skill remarkably well. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did and that Scott's advice can help you become a more authentic leader. Don't forget to subscribe so you'll be notified whenever we release another episode. A few of the pioneers and thought leaders we're speaking with this season include Amy Edmondson, Sally Jenkins, Mark Crowley, and Veda Manager. Thanks for joining and see you on the next episode of Let Go and Lead.